Dr. Helen Chappell and I am a lecturer in the School of Food Science and Nutrition at the University of Leeds. I'm going to tell you a little bit today about some of the research that I do and also about a course that I run for the school that runs across all the uh, first year undergraduate programmes uh, called Food 1010 uh, Food Origins and Form. Okay, so I am a chemist by training and I do computational chemistry. So you won't see me in the lab, but you will see me using the University of Leeds high performance computer, computer uh, to do calculations on various structures. So what I look at are structures that are interesting um, in terms of nutrition or biochemistry. So here on the left is the structure of an iron particle. So this is an iron oxide particle with organic molecules that surround it, which are a kind of coating. And this is the kind of particle that is used to treat iron deficiency anemia. So if you have low iron levels or you're anemic, you might take a drug that looks like this. So something else that I look at is um, soils. So soils, again, are made of minerals. And I'm interested in how drugs interact with those uh, minerals in the soil. So for example, if you have animals on a farm and you treat them with antibiotics, I wanna know, does the antibiotic stay in the field um, when the animals excrete it, or does it get washed out into water courses? So I'm looking at how those antibiotic molecules interact with the various minerals in the soil. So here's just some examples of the work that I do, and I tend to think of the work that I do as inorganic and organic interfaces. So organic uh, matter is matter that's made of carbon, essentially, and your inorganic are your, your minerals. So this is, uh, as I said, the structure of an intravenous iron. So this is a little iron oxide particle with an organic coating. Something else I'm interested in is mammalian bone. So here, this long molecule here is collagen. And this molecule becomes mineralized with these green blobs here. And these are a kind of calcium phosphate, and they're what makes your bone hard. So this is interesting um, in terms of the production of biomaterials, coatings on hip joints, new knee joints, packing materials for surgery. And here's just this, uh, a little example of a uh, mineral with an antibiotic on it. So this is, again, looking at these pharmaceuticals in soils. So soils are tiny particles of minerals, uh, mainly silicates, um, and how they interact with um, antibiotics and other pharmaceuticals is becoming really interesting when we think of the development of antimicrobial resistance. So I work from first principles, so that means that I work from the fundamental um, principles of physics to work out the structure and energy of various molecules. So some of the things that you may have heard of um, that I can calculate are things like x-ray diffraction patterns, an example is here, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, magnetic structures, band gaps. I can also look at properties, so how strong is a material, how dense is a material. Now this is a really exciting way to work. You get to use the big computer, so I run, run one calculation on hundreds of processes at the same time, so that's the equivalent of having hundreds of laptops all strung together, but it's very expensive. So there are other kinds of modeling you can do, like molecular dynamics. So this is an example of a uh, molecular dynamics uh, simulation, and this atom here is going to be fired up into the top right hand corner. So if I play that for you. So what's happening here is we're simulating radioactive decay in a, in a material. OK, so this is just an example to show you how molecular dynamics uh, works. And this um, can be applied to all sorts of structures like things like biofilms, um, the structure of um, minerals, how proteins interact. OK. That's just a little bit about my research. And now I'm going to give you a snippet from a module that I run called Food 1010, Food Origins and Form. So this is one of the first year modules. It's one of the first modules that you'll do, and it goes across all the courses. Every uh, week or every lecture, we cover a new topic, a new kind of food. So this is tea, but we do coffee, we do cheese, we do fruit, we do vegetables. We do something on ancient diets as well.
And this is just not the whole lecture, it's just an a little bit of it to give you an idea of the kind of things that you would do. Okay, so what is tea? So tea are the leaves of uh, an evergreen shrub called Camellia sinensis. Okay, so sinensis means from China. So we think of tea associated with China. And if you left tea to grow, it would eventually become a tree. Um, but when we're growing uh, tea for tea leaves, we pick off these uh, top leaves of the plant and they are called uh, the tips. So these top tips here, top tips. And if you're from the UK, you may have heard of the uh, tea called PG tips. And that's what that means, the top, the top, the best uh, leaves, the youngest leaves. So tea originated in the Eastern Himalayas and it best, and it grows best in warm, humid regions, generally in tropical or subtropical regions. Having said that, it can grow in a remarkable variety of places, including, in fact, Cornwall in the west of England. So uh, this picture here is actually from the Tregothan estate in Cornwall. And there's a, um, a little can here and there's only 11 grams of tea leaves in this little can. So they don't grow much, um, but you can grow tea in other places. OK, so the best tea quality is that which is picked at higher altitudes. So that's not Cornwall. And uh, there are four common varieties, but the two most often that we come across are Sinensis and Asamica. So Asamica should give you a hint as to uh, where tea also grows, not just China, but of course in India, um, in the region of Assam. So there's a long history of tea uh, developing from the Eastern Himalayas. It comes into China where it's used as a medicinal plant. So it's grown generally in monastic gardens. And then it becomes a more general drink across the population and with the growth of the ceramics industry. So we still call cups and saucers China um, that we drink tea from for that reason. But eventually it comes to the West. So it first comes to Amsterdam, then France and then England in 1657. And this is a picture of Garraway's Coffee House in London, which was one of the first places to sell tea that we know about. And on the menu, it didn't just say tea, but it gave you a list of benefits of drinking it. So some examples here are it purifies the blood of that which is gross and heavy. It vanquishes heavy dreams. It encourages the heart and drives away fear. OK, so there were some high expectations on your cup of tea. At this point, tea wasn't. Um, served with milk, it was served warm and it was served from barrels, very much like beer was served at that time as well. OK, so warm and from barrels. It was also very expensive to start with and that meant it was slow to take off. So only the rich and the upper classes were able to afford it. So 1657, three pounds and ten shillings a pound, uh, so that's pound in weight, is equivalent to 264 pounds a kilo in today's money. There's a picture here of Elizabeth Pepys. So for those of you who have heard of Samuel Pepys, he was a 17th century parliamentarian, famously wrote a diary about the Great Fire of London. Uh, but in his diary, he also complains that he keeps having to buy this medicinal tea for his wife, Elizabeth, because she has a continuous cough. So that's how it was used. However, um, as time went on, the big thing that happened was that the trade routes opened. OK, so from the 1730s, you have this clipper trade and uh, this is a clipper. It's a kind of uh, yacht, an ocean going yacht. And some of you may have visited this one, which is the Cutty Sark, which is in dry dock in Greenwich. This was built right at the end of the clipper trade in the 1860s. And it was the fastest clipper that was ever built. Um, and um, this meant that the distance in time um, between London and China was reduced down to just 100 days. And at this point, tea became much more affordable for everybody, from the urchin in the street to the prime minister and the upper classes. So in these lectures, we'll also, as well as looking at um, the growth, the manufacture, the history, we'll also look at some of the health implications. And one of the things that you get with tea, of course, is caffeine. So this is a model of the caffeine molecules is what it looks like. Carbon atoms are in black, oxygen in red, nitrogen in blue and hydrogen in white. So it's a common psychoactive drug and um, how you react to it depends on your genetics. But a lot of people, when they are used to drinking a lot of caffeine, normally coffee drinkers, actually, rather than tea drinkers, get a bit shaky in the morning before they've had their first uh, cup. <coughs> um, 
it has all these various properties that you know about. It keeps you awake. It decreases drowsiness. It relieves fatigue. It can also relieve the perception of pain. So you might find in things like paracetamol tablets that they include caffeine. And again, that's to uh, relieve pain or sensation of pain. It stimulates the release of certain endorphins and hormones. It increases your blood pressure and your heart rate. So if you've drunk a lot of tea or a lot of coffee, you may notice that, that your heart rate goes up. Um, but it also has some negative impacts as well. And it has been uh, linked to a low birth weight for mothers who drink a lot of caffeine, who have a lot of coffee. Uh, but the evidence is contradictory there. OK, so that was just a little uh, brief outline of um, tea and the tea lecture, just a small part of it. But I hope that gives you an idea of the kind of uh, work that we'll be doing in the first year and also the kind of research that I'm involved with. And if you came to work for me as a project student, you might be doing a project on. Thank you very much.